The Stormlight Archive, Book 1, The Way of Kings, began 4,500 years before the current story. It was the end of the last desolation. One of the ten heralds had died, Talanel Alin, also known as Town or Talenelot, Herald of War. Town's body was automatically transferred to damnation, where the heralds are tortured until one of them breaks and a new desolation begins. Another herald named Kalak walked to the predefined meeting place and saw just one herald there, Yezrin, Herald of the Almighty. Yezrin told Kalak that he and the other eight heralds had agreed to abandon the Oath Pact. The herald named Ashard believed that as long as one herald remained true, the Oath Pact might continue. But Kalak worried that the enemy would find a way around it. Nevertheless, after centuries or perhaps millennia of torture, Kalak was broken. So he agreed to do the same as the other eight surviving heralds. He stuck his honor blade into the ground, walked away, and looked back at the one empty spot in the Ring of Swords and thought to himself, forgive us. Sometime between then and the current story, which takes place 4,500 years later, was the Day of Recreants. In one of Dalinar's visions, he was at Feverstone Keep on the Day of Recreants. Dalinar saw two orders of Knights Radiant lay down their shard blades, the Stone Wards and the Wind Runners. They were the first, and they were also the last. Fast forward to the current timeline. As a young man, Dalinar Kulin met and fell for Navani, but he introduced Navani to his older brother Gavilar, and Navani ended up choosing Gavilar as her husband because Dalinar scared her. Dalinar married another woman named Evie, who was no longer alive. At some point, Dalinar traveled west and received the old magic of the Night Watcher. The Night Watcher gives both a curse and a boon. Although Book 1 does not clarify whether this was his curse or his boon, Dalinar no longer has any memories of his wife Evie, and when people say her name, all he hears is shh. King Gavilar conquered Alethkar, leveraging Dalinar as his warrior, but around seven years prior to the current story, Gavilar began to act oddly. Gavilar believed in the Alethi codes of war. Gavilar had visions. Gavilar began to embrace the book called The Way of Kings, and Gavilar seemed to be losing his thirst for battle. In an attempt to fix that, Dalinar brought Gavilar out on a hunt. During that hunt, Dalinar came across a group of Parshendi south of the Shattered Plains. Gavilar found the Parshendi to be a welcoming group, and they introduced him to Chasmphine hunts. Gavilar eventually invited the Parshendi to Kolinar to sign a treaty. The night of the treaty, the Parshendi ordered Seth to kill King Gavilar. Zeth wore white, as was the Parshendi tradition, and he carried Yezrin's honor blade, so Zeth had the surge-binding powers of a windrunner. Before King Gavilar died, he gave Zeth a sphere that glowed with a light that was black, and Gavilar told him that they must not get it, without specifying who they were. Gavilar's dying words were to tell his brother that he must find the most important words a man can say. To Zeth's people, a dying request is sacred, so he took the king's hand, dipped it in the man's own blood, then used it to scroll the message onto the wood. During Gavilar's funeral service, his son Alucar formed the Vengeance Pact. That began the War of Reckoning, ten high princes of Alucar versus the Parshendi. The War of Reckoning against the Parshendi took place on the Shattered Plains. The war had gone on for six years, but the war had become less about destroying the Parshendi and more about competing for gem hearts. On top of that, the Gemhart game effectively divided Alethkar among the Ten High Princes. Another big issue was King Alethkar's paranoia. King Alethkar's father had been killed by the assassin in white, and Alethkar had visions of symbol-headed figures just like Shallan did. He didn't know what they were, so that made Alethkar even more paranoid about assassins. As a result, his uncle Dalinar dedicated many of his own resources to protecting Alethkar rather than hunting for Gemharts. This made Dalinar look weak in the eyes of others, and it was just the first of a few reasons he looked weak. Dalinar had implemented the Alethi Codes of War among his troops, strict policies during wartime. Dalinar had begun listening to readings of the Way of Kings, just as Gavilar had done towards the end of his life, and for the last few months, Dalinar had begun to experience visions whenever there was a high storm. All of these factors added to the narrative that Dalinar Kolin was no longer the strong man that he once was. He was no longer the Blackthorn. Due to Dalinar's visions, Adolin thought that Dalinar was losing his wits, and Dalinar himself was worried that Adolin might be right. In fact, Dalinar thought about and decided to abdicate his seat as High Prince in favor of Adolin. 
Adolin pushed back on that, and Navani began to transcribe Dalinar's visions. Eventually, she determined that his visions were real. High level, the visions led Dalinar to believe that Alethkar needed to be united before the Night of Sorrows, the Everstorm, and the True Desolation. Dalinar told Elokar that they should abandon the Shattered Plains and return to Kolinar. Elokar did not like that idea, so Dalinar came up with a new idea. Dalinar wanted to do joint plateau assaults with other High Princes in hopes of getting into a big enough battle with the Parshendi that they could all but end the war. Unfortunately, none of the High Princes would work with Dalinar. None until Sadius. Earlier in the story, Elokar had created a false flag by cutting his own saddle. As a result, his saddle fell off in the middle of a Kazamfine hunt. Elokar appointed High Prince Sadius as High Prince of Information. Sadius looked into the saddle and determined that Dalinar had not tried to kill Elokar. That was true, but it was also part of a shady plan to gain Dalinar's trust. In one of his visions, Dalinar had asked if he should trust Sadius, and the voice said yes. Dalinar did not realize that the voice was not actually answering him. Therefore, when Sadius cleared Dalinar's name, Dalinar mistakenly placed his trust in Sadius despite the warnings of his son Adolin and his sister-in-law, Navani. Sadius agreed to do joint plateau assaults with Dalinar, and in one of those assaults, Dalinar saved Sadius' life. During those joint plateau assaults, Dalinar continued to use his own bridges, which were pulled by slow-moving chulls. But then, a chasm fiend was spotted on a massive plateau called the Tower. The Barshendi typically brought around 10,000 people to the Tower. That is around a third or even half of all the remaining Barshendi, according to Sadius' estimates. So this scenario was exactly what Dalinar had hoped for. A major battle versus the Barshendi. If they defeated them there, it could end the War of Vengeance. Dalinar was able to gather 8,000 men for the short notice assault, and Sadius mobilized 7,000 men, so it was a massive attack. Sadius convinced Dalinar to leave his slow moving bridges behind and use Sadius' bridges instead. The battle started off great, but then Sadius betrayed Dalinar. Sadius retreated with all his troops and bridges, leaving Dalinar and his forces to die. Thankfully, Bridge 4 ran back with their bridge and saved Dalinar. So let's take a step back and revisit Kaladin and Bridge 4. Nine years prior to the current storyline, Kaladin was around 10 years old living in a town called Hearthstone. Kaladin's father Liren was a surgeon, and he was raising Kaladin to become one as well. A couple of years later, Kaladin had begun to develop romantic feelings for Laurel, but Laurel was the daughter of the city lord. Laurel was Light Eyes. Laurel encouraged Cal to defeat a Shardbearer so as to become Light Eyes as well. One time, Cal got into a quarterstaff fight with an older boy. Cal lost the fight, but that one moment holding the quarterstaff sang to him. A single moment of clarity in an otherwise confusing world. A couple years later, Laurel's father, Bright Lord Wistio, died. When that happened, Cal's father, Liren, stole the Bright Lord's spheres so as to pay for Kaladin's education in the future. The town's new Bright Lord was Bright Lord Rashon. Rashon knew that Liren had stolen the spheres, so he hated Liren from the very start. At one point, Rashon and his son were attacked by a white spine. Rashon could see his son still moving as Liren worked on him, so Rashon yelled at Liren to stop working on him and help his son. Unfortunately, Rashon's son's wounds were mortal, so Liren saved Rashon's life instead. This was the second reason why Rashon hated Liren. First, the stolen spheres, then the death of his son. A couple years later, Bright Lord Amaram came to Hearthstone to recruit men to his army. Since there were not enough volunteers, Amaram chose five from Rashon's list. One of those five was Kaladin's younger brother, Tien. To his parents' dismay, Cal decided to join the army as well. Cal promised to bring his brother back. Unfortunately, within the first four months, Tien was killed. Kaladin wrote a letter to his parents, telling them that he had failed, but he never heard back from them. Kaladin rose to squad leader by just 19 years old. During this time, Kaladin would find young, untrained men that reminded him of his little brother. He protected these kids, so they felt grateful. That gratitude attracted an honor spren named Sophrena, though she did not show herself until a few months later when he was a slave. Kaladin dreamed of fighting on the Shattered Plains, where he had assumed that the Light Eyes were honorable, where he had assumed that the fighting actually meant something. 
Kaladin saw his opportunity to earn his way to the Shattered Plains by taking out a battalion lord, and he did just so. He killed the man. But then, a shard bear appeared and attacked Kaladin's leader, Bright Lord Amaram. Kaladin killed the shard bear, but instead of thanking Kaladin, Amaram took the shard blade, killed Kaladin's men, and branded Kaladin as a slave. Kaladin escaped his slave masters ten times over the course of eight months, but every time he was recaptured. Kaladin earned another brand that labeled him as dangerous. During his time as a slave, Silfrena had begun to show herself. Kaladin thought that she was an odd windsprint. Cal's final slave master brought Kaladin to the Shattered Plains. On their way there, another slave showed signs of an illness. It was nothing bad. All he needed was a little extra water for five days or so. But the slave master didn't listen to Kaladin. Instead, he had the guy killed. Kaladin had been holding on to a poisonous leaf called Blackbane. But when he saw his fellow slave needlessly killed, he accidentally crushed the Blackbane and dropped it. So Frenis saw that Kaladin changed. He had finally broke. Cal stopped fighting. Kaladin was assigned to Bridge 4 under High Prince Sadius. Bridge 4 was infamous for experiencing the most deaths during bridge runs. Out of the 25 men that had survived Cal's first bridge run, only Cal and one other man were alive after a few weeks. Cal became very depressed, and as a result, Sophrena had to leave him. She could no longer watch him in such a depressed state. While she was away, Cal walked off to the honor chasm and thought about jumping. But then, Syl showed back up with Blackbane leaves. Syl didn't realize that it was poisonous. All she knew was that Kaladin had stopped fighting when he had dropped the Blackbane leaves on the way to the Shattered Plains. Counterintuitively, Syl's gift of poison worked. Cal stepped back away from the ledge. Syl encouraged Cal to help the bridgeman, so he bribed a bridge sergeant named Gaz to stay out of his way and introduced himself to other members of his bridge crew, starting with Teft. That was the night that Kaladin told himself that he would find a way to protect them. As bridge leader, Cal could have manned the bridge from the back, but he told Rock to get out of his spot, and Cal took up the position front and center. Cal healed his fellow bridgemen and bribed Gaz to let him carry them back to the war camp. Injured bridgemen were not allowed food rations, so Cal asked his men to pool their resources. Unfortunately. They said no, but Rox said that he would give some to the injured man named Haber since Kaladin had switched spots with him on that bridge run. Cal began carrying planks in the lumber yard so as to strengthen his body in preparation for bridge runs, but no one else from Bridge 4 joined him, not until Rox stew. Rock used to be a cook, so he made a stew and everyone came out that night and ate it. The next morning, most of the bridge crew joined Cal in the practice yard. Bridge 4 was his. Now, he had to keep them alive long enough for that to mean something. Kaladin did not yet realize that bridgemen were bait, so he taught Bridge 4 a new method of carrying the bridge on its side. Bridge 4 used this method on a plateau run, and it worked great. The bridge shielded them from the Parshendi arrows. Unfortunately, the side carry method came with an unexpected consequence. Other bridge crews saw what Bridge 4 was doing, and they tried to do the same. But the other bridge crews hadn't practiced the side carry, so they dropped their bridges and the scene turned to chaos. Bridge 4 had unintentionally doomed the assault. As a result, Sadius executed the Light Eyes bridge crew captain, and Kaladin was tied up in the next high storm. Teft used to be part of a group known as the Envisagers, a group that awaited the return of the Knights Radiant. So Teft knew some things that other bridgemen did not. Teft had seen a spren dancing around Kaladin when he performed a beautiful kata during chasm duty. So Tef suspected that Kaladin might have the powers of the Knight's Radiant. Therefore, Tef placed a sphere in Kaladin's hand right before the high storm. So Frenna did her best to help as well. She told Kaladin to grab the roof, and then to grab the ring to which the rope was tied on top of the roof. So Frenna stood in front of him, her face to the wind tiny hands forward as if she were trying to hold back the storm. When Kaladin was in the eye of the storm, an enormous face appeared just in front of his, a face of blackness, inhuman, smiling. Then, the high storm hit him again. It beat Kaladin up very badly, but in the end, Kal survived thanks to Sil and Teft. Teft continued to sneak spheres to Kaladin so as to help him heal over the next ten days, and Sil continued to fight for Kal as well. 
While Kaladin fought for his life, he saw Deathspren. Only the dying could see Deathspren. Only the very, very lucky few survived after that. Kaladin could barely move, but he saw Sylphrena in the form of pure light. Her face was nobler than before, like a warrior from a forgotten time, not childlike at all. She stood guard on his chest, holding a sword made of light, and whenever one of the Deathspren got too close, she would charge it, wielding her radiant blade. To everyone's surprise, Kaladin got out of bed after just 10 days. Unfortunately, the new Light Eyes Bridge Crew captain told Bridge 4 that they would be on call and have chasm duty every day. That meant that they were going to die twice as fast. It broke Kaladin, so he gave up. But then, Tef said that giving up seemed pathetic, that they should keep fighting until the end. You know, journey before destination. Zigzal explained that those words were part of the Knight's Radiance motto, so Cal walked off and reflected on the motto with Sill. Life before death, strength before weakness, journey before destination. The first ideal of the Knight's Radiance. After embracing the first ideal, Calden returned to Bridge 4 and told them that they were going to train and then escape. During the next high storm, Calden dreamed that he was the storm. Members of Bridge 4 had to hold him down to prevent him from walking out into the storm. The storm father spoke to Kaladin and warned him of odium. During nighttime chasm duty, Kaladin and Teft trained Bridge 4 how to fight with the spear. But they needed more time, so Cal came up with a new plan. Cal had noticed that the Parshendi revere their dead, so he cut carapace off of dead Parshendi and he wore it during a bridge run. When the Parshendi saw him, they all focused their arrows on him. By this point, Kaladin had finally learned to breathe in stormlight, so he was fast, and he was able to survive. The bridge assault was a massive success, but it almost turned into a massacre. During the assault, some Parshendi archers snuck up and attempted to ambush Bridge 4 while they rested during the battle. Thankfully, Dalinar Kalin saw that happening, so he ran over and in seconds, the squad of 50 archers had been reduced to corpses. As Dalinar ran back into the battle, he turned and raised his blade in a salute of respect toward the bridgemen. Bridge 4 was part of several of Sadius' joint plateau assaults with Dalinar. The last of these joint assaults occurred at a plateau called the Tower. The Tower is the plateau where Bridge 4's side carry method resulted in chaos, so this was the second time that they assaulted this plateau, and this second time would be even more memorable than the first. Sadius betrayed Dalinar by abandoning him. Kaladin told Matal that Bridge 4 was tired, that they would rest a little and follow with their own bridge, and Matal let them do that, hoping that the Parshendi would kill them. So Bridge 4 was left behind. They were finally free. They were going to escape. But they couldn't do it. Syl appeared as Cal had never seen her before, the size of an ordinary human. She faced eastward. It made his very soul twist in knots to see that look of despair on her face. Are Windspren attracted to wind? She asked softly. Or do they make it? I don't know, Kaladin said. Does it matter? Perhaps not. You see, I've remembered what kind of sprint I am. Is this the time for it, Syl? I bind things, Kaladin, she said, turning and meeting his eyes. I am honor spren, spirit of oats, of promises, and of nobility. In the end, they all agreed that they had to do it. Kaladin Stormblast and Bridge 4 returned to save Dalinar, Adolin, and 2,653 of Dalinar's original 8,000 men. And in the process, Kaladin Stormblast said the first ideal as well as his second ideal. I will protect those who cannot protect themselves. Now, let's dive into Dalinar and Kaladin's visions. In Kaladin's vision, a voice told him that the Oath Pact was shattered. That was a reference to Ahorietium the day that nine of the heralds laid down their shards. Dalinar had a similar vision, but it was actually very different. In the Feverstone Keep vision, Dalinar saw knights radiant lay down their shards. This event is known as the Day of Recreants. So Kaladin saw the heralds lay down their shards, and Dalinar saw the knights radiant lay down their shards. Two different events at two different times. In Dalinar's vision, the voice told Dalinar to read the book 
and unite them ahead of the Night of Sorrows, the Everstorm, and the True Desolation. The book that was referenced is a book called The Way of Kings. Noadon is a king who wrote that book, and Dalinar had a vision with Noadon. In the Noadon vision, they looked down over the destruction of a desolation. There were stone creatures five or six times the size of humans. Noadon said that the surge binders needed to be better, and that he needed to unite the kings so as to prepare for the next time the heralds returned, for the next desolation. When Dalinar came out of the vision, Navani had him repeat the last line. Navani figured out that Dalinar's ramblings were not actually ramblings. During his visions, Dalinar had been speaking an old tongue known as the Dawn Chant. Therefore, the Noadon vision proved to Adolin, Renarin, and Navani that Dalinar's visions were real. Dalinar had another vision in Natanatan. Natanatan was a kingdom from the past that included the region that is now known as the Shattered Plains. In the Natanatan vision, Dalinar fought alongside two shard bearers. They were Knights Radiant. Since Dalinar was a very skillful fighter, one of them told Dalinar to come to Uruthiru, and the voice in the vision told Dalinar to act with honor, and honor would aid him. Honor was also mentioned in Kaladin's vision. Kaladin dreamed that he was the storm, and the voice in Kaladin's vision mentioned Child of Tanavast, Child of Honor, Child of One, long since departed. So one takeaway from both of their visions is the implied shard named Honor. Another takeaway that they shared was much darker. The voice in Kaladin's vision warned that Odium is the most dangerous of all the 16 shards. The voice also said that Odium reigns. When Cal asked Syl if she had ever heard of something called Odium, she hissed and flew off. So clearly, Syl was not a fan of Odium. The reason why was alluded to in Dalinar's vision. In Dalinar's final vision of the book, he was in Kolinar, and he spoke to a man who claimed to be the Almighty, the creator of mankind. The Almighty said that he could not see into the future as well as cultivation, which is another shard on Roshar. But even so, the Almighty was worried. The Almighty said that someone must lead them. Someone must unite them. Someone must protect them. The Almighty said to speak again the ancient oaths and return to men the shards they once bore. He said that the Knights Radiant must stand again. The Almighty said that Odium is bound by some rules. He recommended getting a champion and, if possible, the Dawn Shards. In the end, the Almighty said that he was dead, that Odium had killed him, and that he was sorry. So both Dalinar and Kaladin received visions during high storms. The visions warned of Odium and the coming Everstorm, the true desolation. The visions also spoke of honor, and Kaladin began to bond an honor spren named Sylphrena. Kaladin was not the only person to interact with Spren, so now let's take a look at Shalan and Yasna. Shalan is from Yaqaved. The people of Yaqaved are referred to as Vaden. As a reminder, the shard bearer who tried to kill Bright Lord Amaram had been Vaden, and Amaram believed he may have worked for Thydekar and the Ghostbloods. The Ghostbloods had given Shalan's father a soul caster. Those men had been financing Shalan's father in his bid to become High Prince. Her father's advisor, a man named Luesh, was also part of the Ghostbloods. Luesh used the Soulcaster to create marble. The Soulcaster marble helped Shalon's father finance his agenda. But then, Shalon's father died. To make matters worse, the Soulcaster broke. The Ghostbloods wanted it back, so Shalon tracked down Yasna Kalin in hopes of stealing Yasna's Soulcaster. Unfortunately for her family, Shalon fell in love with her apprenticeship. So Shalon was torn on whether or not to steal Yasna's Soulcaster. That changed after one of Yasna's philosophical lessons. Yasna lured a few thieves into an alley and killed them with soul casting. She then asked Shalon to reflect on the legality and morality of doing so. This exercise frightened Shalon, so she used it to justify stealing Yasna's Soulcaster. Shalon then arranged a ship home, but while she waited, a lot happened. First, Shalon had lunch with Yasna and King Taravangian of Carbron. Shalon drew a picture of Taravangian and was frightened when she noticed symbol-headed figures in her sketch. She ran back to her room in terror. That same thing happened again with a young man named Capsule. Once again, 
Shalana ran away, but this time she kept on drawing, and the symbol-headed figures followed her. Shalan fell into Shadesmar, grabbed a bead, and luckily popped back out into the physical realm. Unfortunately, a goblet in her room turned to blood and spilled out onto the floor. Shalon thought that she had soul-casted the goblet with Yasna's soul-caster because she didn't realize yet that she herself had soul-casting powers. So Shalon was afraid that the soul-casted blood would expose her theft of Yasna's soul-caster. In order to hide what she had done, Shalon cut herself, and Yasna bought it. She thought that Shalon had cut herself due to stress. Yasna felt guilty for having overworked Shalon. That is why, when Shalon woke up with the nurses, Yasna was there, worried and waiting. So Shalon's lie was a good one. Yasna did not yet realize that Shalon had stolen her soul caster. But that wouldn't last long. The young Ardent who had been flirting with Shalon was actually a member of the Ghostbloods, and he tried to poison Yasna. Yasna does not like jam, so Capsule poisoned the bread and put an antidote in the jam so that Shalon would not die if she ate the bread. Yasna soul casted the bread before eating it, so she was not poisoned. But she also soul casted the jam, and thus she unknowingly removed the antidote. As a result, Capsule and Shalon were both poisoned when they ate the bread and jam. Shalon did not know that Yasna could soul cast without a soul caster, so as Shalon died of poisoning, she exposed her stolen soul caster so that Yasna could heal her. And she did just so. Yasna healed Shalon, but she also fired her. But then, Shalon thought back on the events with her photographic memory, and Shalon saw that Yasna had soul casted the bread without having a soul caster on her. So Shalon realized that Yasna had powers, and Shalon realized that she herself had the same power of soul casting. She went to Yasna one last time and told Yasna about her family problems and asked for a second chance. She called out Yasna's power and she said she had it too. But Yasna was not sold. Yasna would not take her back as a ward. As her final Hail Mary, Shalon asked the creatures in her head to bring her to Shadesmar again. In order to do so, Shalon had to tell a powerful truth about herself. Shalon's truth was that she had killed her father. A major reveal. That was a good truth. So Shalon fell into Shadesmar with just a single dim sphere, unaware that that was a very dangerous thing to do. Thankfully, Yasna had a soft spot for Shalon, so she entered Shadesmar herself and pulled Shalon back out into the physical realm. Shalon then convinced Yasna to give her that second chance, and they got right to work. Yasna had come to the conclusion that the Voidbringers were the Parshmen, and after doing her own research, Shalon agreed. So their book one arc ended with Yasna telling Shalon that they needed to go to the Shattered Plains. And they were not the only people headed there. Now let's take a look at Zeth Sun Sun Volano, Zeth Sun Naturo, Truthless of Shinovar. In order to do so, let's go all the way back to the night of King Gavilar's death. Before Gavilar died, he gave Zeth a sphere and told him that they must not get it. After Gavilar died, the Parshendi tossed away Zeth's oath stone. So Zeth had the sphere, but he no longer had a master. Zeth was picked up by a merchant who brought Zeth to Yaakoved. That is where Zeth hid the sphere that Gavilar had given to him. Zeth was then passed around to dozens of different masters, but they all got rid of him because he made them uncomfortable. Perhaps they could sense the truth, that he was capable of so much more than they dared use him for. Unfortunately, someone who knew his powers found him, they killed his master and gave him a new list. The new list included some of the most powerful people in the world. So Seth went around killing them. He even killed King Hanavanar of Yaakoved. The last person on Zeth's list was King Taravangian of Karbron. But lo and behold, Taravangian was actually Zeth's new master. Taravangian showed Zeth a secret room in the Conclave where Taravangian kills people in order to hear their dying words, since prophetic death rattles began around seven years prior. Then, Taravangian told Seth that he needed to go kill Dalinar Kulin. Luckily for him, Dalinar had gained a powerful new ally. When Dalinar returned to the war camps, he traded his shard blade for all of Sadius's bridgemen. 
Dalinar appointed Kaladin to the rank of captain and asked him to be his family's honor guard. After Dalinar traded his shard blade for Sadius' bridgeman, Dalinar went to his nephew, King Elokar, and he beat him up. Dalinar proved Elokar that if he wanted to, he could have killed him. Dalinar didn't want to kill Elokar because he loves him like a son. So basically, Dalinar finally convinced his nephew Elokar to trust him. Dalinar told Elokar that things were going to change, that Elokar was going to appoint Dalinar as High Prince of War, and together they were going to win the war. Last but not least, Dalinar told Elokar that he was courting Elokar's mother, Navani. And now, the ending. The best part about the ending of Book 1 is that the very last chapter, the epilogue, ties back directly to the ending of the very first chapter, the prelude. As a reminder, nine of the heralds survived the last desolation. Those nine heralds decided to abandon the Oath Pact by dropping their shards and remaining on Roshar. So they did not return to Damnation as they were supposed to. But one herald had died during the last desolation, Talonel Elin. So he had automatically returned to Damnation. It was 4,500 years before the current story. That entire time, he was tortured. In the epilogue, Wit was hanging out in Kolinar when a ragged shardbearer walked up. That shardbearer was none other than Talonel Alin, Herald of War. So, after 4,500 years of torture, Town was back. Town walked up and warned that the desolation had come and he had failed.